There you are. And where am I? Where am I this week for this week's video? I'm at our mezzanine wine bar. Of course, many of our videos over the last year have been shot from up here. I've been standing up here all alone at this place, wishing that we could admit guests upstairs, and now we can. I will no longer be alone as of this evening. This is to announce that, reservation only, you can now visit us at our wine bar. Our hours are a little shortened. We wanna be careful, we're a little more spread out, but what wonderful news. We can now have you upstairs or out in front of the store. And for upstairs, it is in fact, reservation only, please. Don't email, please. Give us a call, just phone. Yeah, the old way, right? Give us a call and we will set you up if we have room for a nice time up here, maybe 90 minutes long, how about that? Be nice to the person waiting for you and spend a good 90 minutes here, have a good time, have a glass of wine. Yes, the wine bar menu is getting longer and longer. We're not yet offering flights, but I am getting a little more optimistic and ambitious with this wine bar by the glass list because now we have more people to entertain. It's not just those five tables out in front of the store, it is also Finally, this wine bar up here, how cool. I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy one of these chairs for a second here. Well, I tell you about this champagne, and um, of course mention the very, very obvious. This Sunday is Easter Sunday. Let's tell you something that may not be so obvious. We are closed. It's just kind of our tradition to close up on Easter and take a day off along with the rest of you. And so please do your Easter shopping today, tomorrow, Saturday, and sorry about Sunday, but we'll be closed. So that's an announcement. The other announcement, of course, is the wine bar. Make reservations, please. Call us for a reservation at our wine bar. We close the wine bar at seven o'clock on tonight, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We close at seven, and we send the staff home at 7.45 at the latest. We can't leave you here, so unfortunately, you would need to leave with them, if that's all right. Okay, get off the wine bar subject, tell you about some wonderful wines that actually do kind of segue nicely because I'm gonna put many of these onto this weekend's Easter wine wine bar menu. So let's talk about some wines that are so nice for Easter. How do you find them downstairs? You look for one of these guys. In just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna be hanging up eggs everywhere. You can go on an Easter egg hunt and look for Easter wines, all right? They will be identified by these little nifty things. If you don't want our help, that's fine. Go on your own Easter egg hunt. If you'd like our help, we'd love to help you. We'd love to walk around with you. And uh, we might even carry your basket for you. How about that? So let's tell you, finally, I keep belaboring the point and not getting to it, that we have Easter wines to tell you about. Some of which will go on the wine bar menu, all of which will be identified by an egg downstairs. Champagne Colin. This is a champagne we've carried before, but kind of forgot about it. And a vendor reminded me of it once again with a healthy pour. And we clinked glasses and enjoyed one of the best $40 champagnes I've tasted in a very, very long time. This is what we call grower champagne, meaning the producer is small and grows his or her own fruit. It comes from the southern part of Champagne that we call the Aube or the Cote de Bar. And it down there often emphasizes Pinot Noir. And in fact, this one, I believe is 80% or 90% Pinot, the remainder being Chardonnay, our other good Champagne friend. It's lovely Champagne. I know a lot of you are gonna be wanting to do Prosecco with your Easter brunch. Why don't you take up a notch and do the real thing? Forget the orange juice. Don't mistreat this Champagne, drink it straight. Delicious stuff. I do like white wines. I like bright whites and less oaky things. In fact, white wines that never saw an oak barrel is kind of the idea for Easter brunch, for Easter dinner. It just, those wines taste kind of like spring to me. So let's see how this one pans out that way. This is brand new for us. I'm sorry about the lighting. I'm not sure how well this label is showing this time around, but this is called Iris Pinot Gris. Now it comes from the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which was originally famous for Pinot Noir, of course, and the white wine of Oregon was Pinot Gris. It seems like Chardonnay, the ubiquitous varietal, is taking it over up there. And I think well, that's fine, but I am glad Oregon is remembering to continue to make fantastic Pinot Gris in that it is truly one of the world's great places for it. I mean, we can think of Chardonnay coming from all over the place, right? But how many places, world wine places, can you, um, um, attached to the Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio grape. Of course, Northern Italy and of course, Alsace, France, but 
Another, of course, ought to be the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and let's test that out. This is brand new to us. I tasted it two days ago, and I said, you know, Easter's coming up, and um, there's no better white wine for Easter than a no oak, fresh, high-fruited Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris is what they call it in Oregon, Pinot Grigio, same grape, lively. This has nice stuffing to it. Pinot Grigio can be thinner in style. I like Oregon Pinot Gris because it has a satin or velvety texture to it, and that's about to happen in my mouth. Mm. Very lush, stone fruit, citrus, some nice savory qualities too, almost saline. It's really delicious Pinot Gris. It sells for well under $20, especially for you wine club members getting your 10% discount. I feel brave about opening this bottle and tasting it in front of you because I will be putting it on the wine bar menu tonight so you can check it out before you make your commitment to Easter brunch or dinner for this wine. All right, Iris, welcome aboard. It's good to have a nice Oregon Pinot Gris back on the shelf. I'm now gonna tell you something about um, something about a wine a bit more interesting and a bit more maverick. And this wine actually arrives today. I tasted it three days ago. Any minute now, the bell is gonna ring downstairs and that'll be the delivery person with this beautiful wine. It's unexpectedly beautiful. La Oveja from Santa Julia in Argentina. This is 100% Torrontes, Argentina's grape. Just as the Willamette Valley is the home to Pinot Gris, the white grape of Argentina is, for good or for bad, and often for bad, frankly, Torrontes. I say for bad because it really works well for people, for the common palate. This kills it for Easter. This is organically grown, organically made natural Torrontes. I've never had such a thing. We've never carried such a thing. It is our first natural uh, torrontes, it may be the only one made. What does it do differently from the typical torrontes? I gotta finish this, I don't have a spit bucket with me. Mm, that's tasty Pinot Gris. All right, back to our organically, naturally made torrontes, meaning no sulfites added, meaning the grapes were grown organically out in that vineyard. Torrontes can taste and smell a little bit more like the, let's say, you mistakenly lick one of those rose-shaped soaps that's in the tin vessel on grandma's uh, vanity, and you thought they were candy and realized, oh, these beautiful things are actually soap. You never make that mistake again as a kid, right? Well, that can be the Torrontes experience. This wine has much more going on, much more spice, floral qualities, but not the rosy nastiness of those grandma soaps. And what means something much more importantly here is what's gonna happen in my mouth. This finally is a Torrontes that has texture. This really reminds me of an Alsatian Gewürztraminer. And since I don't have a great Alsatian Gewürztraminer downstairs this time around, and it is a wonderful wine with ham, why don't we do something we've never done before instead? This will kill it with the Easter ham, I promise you. It's a naturally made Torrontes from Argentina, Santa Julia. Get in on this, it's very fun to do. Now, while we're on the theme, I'm not answering the phone. <laughs> while we're on the theme of maverick and different, this is not so maverick and different for you anymore. At least if you're one of the people, many, many people who last year bought into our six Vermentino sampler, remember that? Yes. That was about 10 months ago now when we were getting Vermentino into your mouth six different ways if you were to commit to that six pack sampler. That took you to Italy and Tuscany and Italy and Sardinia and up to the south of France. And there was even a wine from the Piemonte region of Italy too. So six different bottles of Vermentino certainly got you more aware of that very pronounceable grape. Vermentino, uh, unlike other grapes out there, is uh, selling better and better. And I think one reason is because you can say it. Vermentino, is a uh, slightly richer than Pinot Grigio grape. So we all know Italian Pinot Grigio. Vermentino gives you more lushness, more melon richness in the mouth. This one comes from the northern part of Sardinia called Galura. So it's a Vermentino di Galura and it's brand new. It just got here and let's debut it. Let's debut it at Easter, okay? I think it would be a lovely Easter wine because it's one, yet another one of those nice fruit forward but unoaked whites. So look for this, Canaili, Canaili, Vermentino di Galura, 
It's delicious. I really like it. What else do we have here? Okay, here it comes. You knew we were gonna do this, right? What is more appropriate in style, in spirit, and in color than a dry rosé for Easter? And finally, the French ones are coming here, as well as our old friend, Domaine de la Fouquette. Now, Fouquette kind of sounds like it could be the Easter Bunny's favorite wine, if you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, I'm not going to elaborate. Or maybe it's a way of the French uh, responding Fouquet to the pandemic, but either way, let's have this at Easter, shall we? This Domaine de la Fouquet will be tasted before Easter on our wine bar menu. And just pronounce it carefully so you don't get in trouble. Domaine de la Fouquet, one of our favorites absolutely every year. It is here. It's from Provence, France, and it is tasty stuff. Ethereal, delicate, wispy, good rosé. Actually, you know, I'm gonna prove it to myself. And once again, I'm bereft of a, a bucket, so. It's early, I promise to eat something. Okay, uh, where's that Fouquet? I just like saying the word, as you can tell. Easter Bunny's favorite rosé. Domaine de la Fouquet. As you can see, this bottle's nearly empty. Believe it or not, we opened this last Saturday. This is Thursday morning. I tried this out earlier today. It's killing it, it's still working. What that tells me is that Fouquet will hang on for uh, all of the rosé season, I believe. It'll do just fine and get better and better as I talk into my glass. Lousy acoustic, sorry. Yeah, I like it when a dry rosé from Provence gives you more than fruit. Yes, there's that little bit of watermelon and cherry going on. Some people call it Jolly Ranchers, but there's more interesting stuff than that happening in a good dry Provence rosé. What is it? I would call it fennel or tarragon. There's something wonderfully herbal, as if there's herbs growing near the vineyard and somehow attaching themselves to the grapes. Oh man, yeah. Yes, open Saturday and still good today. That's remarkable. Even at room temperature, that bottle's gone. Okay, no more drinking, but I will discuss a couple of more wines with you. And let's just admit it, a lot of you drink Chardonnay. I mean, it's, it's a healthy habit, right? Why not get out of the big oaky, buttery Chardonnay for Easter and do something just ever so slightly more elegant and delicate? Now, if you were to go to Burgundy and head all the way up to the northern part of Burgundy called Chablis, the wine would be really lean and streamlined, uh, more of a laser beam kind of an effect. 100% Chardonnay, but Chablis is minerally. We have it down there. That would be wonderful, but let's take you to the Côte d'Or, which is the most famous belt of land in uh, north to south in Burgundy. So Burgundy is all about place. Burgundy is the name of the place, but within it, you've got all these place names. So you've got the Côte d'Or, and within the Côte d'Or, you've got the Côte de Bone, and that's where this comes from, and yet it has yet another name, Santonet, and yet another name, the actual vineyard, which is called Les Terrasses de Bivo. I've never had to say that before, but I think I got it right. Santonet is good juice. If you don't want to buy up for Merceau or Pouligny Montrachet or Chassagne Montrachet, <laughs> I'm not knowing what I'm saying, it's not the wine. Um, the Santonet here is a wonderful alternative that just costs one price point down, and yet it does aspire to taste like those more high-end white burgundies. Gorgeous stuff. You will know it's Chardonnay. It has nice body, but it's elegant, and it remembers the limestone rock that it grows out of. This is a gorgeous white burgundy that prices for under $40, and uh, it just is hitting the shelf today. Very happy to have found it. Santonet, uh, that's of course the place. The producer is Justin, or Justin Girardin, Girardin. There's a lot of Girardin family members doing their own labels. This is Justin doing it. You would think we are not talking about any red wines for Easter, but one is an automatic, isn't it? It would be Pinot Noir. Why Pinot? Because a lot of you will be having more delicate food at Easter, whether fish or ham. And lamb, of course, is bigger, but that's another tradition that we're about to address. But in the meantime, a lot of people love the springy, fruit forwardness of a, of a California Pinot Noir. And this is just to remind you that we have restocked the shelf with one of our favorites from one of our favorite Pinot Noir places called the Russian River Valley. One of our favorite producers there is certainly Hartford Court, who makes not one Pinot, but probably eight different Pinot, no, Pinot Noirs every year from the Sonoma Coast and the Russian River. This is their basic, you could call it Russian River version, their entry level. There's nothing entry level about the quality happening in the bottle. This does go a little bit over $30, and for that $30, you're getting 
wonderfully balanced, elegant, and yet totally fruit forward and understandable, delicious Pinot Noir. This isn't the earthy, uh, dirty stuff. This is beautiful fruit and flowers happening in your nose and mouth. And don't forget to smell it and use the big glass, the Pinot Noir glass, if you want to fully know it. Hartford Court, Russian River Pinot Noir, back on the shelf. There's one more wine to tell you about, then I'll leave you be. And it's a wine we've mentioned once before, but if you are doing lamb, you should consider having Syrah. And if you're doing Syrah, you should highly consider having Northern Rhone Syrah. The Northern Rhone of France is the birthplace of the great variety Syrah. And when you have it from there, you are not expecting the, uh, let's say, Barossa Australia uh, version of Shiraz, or even the type of Syrah that you would be getting from really warmer than Northern Rhone, Paso Robles, California. No, this is a cooler place. There's a lot of mineral going on and you get really exotic qualities that go with exotic flavors of lamb. If you like lamb, you will like Northern Rhone Syrah. That's a promise from me. You get black olive and licorice and violets and something kind of more interesting like cured meats, like the meats hanging from a ceiling in a delicatessen, I'm fond of saying and you get smoke and you get fruit. There is blackberries in there as well, but it's a whole panoply of wonderful exotic things going on that really match the exotic qualities of that meat called lamb. Now, a qualifier. This wine I talked about a couple of weeks ago, discussing the topic of reduction. When you open this and immediately pour it into a Pinot Noir glass, because that's a great glass for this wine, and smell it, you may say, whoa, was that you or did you do that? In other words, it's a little farty and that's reduction, but it's reduction on purpose. Reduction is not always a flaw. In fact, sometimes it's intended because it can be protective of the wine. This winemaker who used no added sulfites in the wine wanted to protect it otherwise. And so he employed reduction. Reduction, we don't need to elaborate on what it is, except that is, it is in this case a good thing, keeping this wine protected and if you swirl and swirl and swirl, and I want you to swirl for 30 seconds and smell, nope, still there. Swirl for a minute, that's still kind of there. And I'll bet after you swirl for two or three minutes, then all of a sudden reduction will have resolved and you'll get those more exotic and not so nasty qualities that I referred to earlier that are representative of a Northern Rhone Syrah. This is Sylvain Badel. I promise you that this Syrah costing in the very low 20s and maybe wine club members get it under 20, somewhere around there represents $30, $35 value from the Northern Rhone. The Northern Rhone can be a little more expensive because there is less arable land there available to the farmer. It's harder to farm because it's often terraced and steep and a tractor often can't navigate those uh, crazy river banks. So Northern Rhone Syrah is always more expensive, but people who love it buy up. You don't have to buy up as far here. Sylvain Badel Syrah with the lamb at Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Let's see you at the wine bar. Please make a reservation and we will see you up here soon. I will be lonely no longer. Cheers.